All right, so now we move on to Nine Bill Hochstedler from Knight County. He's running for United States Senate. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir, and to meet you. Thank you. Good to be here. We, we talked on the phone, uh, had a little bit limited amount of time there. Um, but let's start out with, you know, obviously you know as well as I do that most of the people in the state don't know who you are. And so let me give you a few minutes to explain to folks who you are and how you came to be here. Sure. So my name again is Bill Hochstedler, and I'm, I'm running for the United States Senate. Um, let me give you a little bit about background. I think it's just uh, worth doing that for a couple minutes just to clear the air as to who I am. So I'm a healthcare executive with the Mayo Clinic out of Rochester, Minnesota. The reason I'm in Nevada is Mayo Clinic wanted a West Coast VP. I could have picked any state, anywhere west of the Mississippi. I decided to pick Nevada because I believe Nevada represents the, the values that I feel are important to me. It's a, a state that represents freedom. If you look at our rural counties, I live in a rural county, I live in Nye County, I don't live in the cities. I do go to the cities quite a bit, and the requirement is that I live an hour from an airport. So I live in Pahrump, Nye County, which is exactly an hour from the airport. So I fill that requirement, and I live where I want to live. Nye County is more free than Clark County, more free than Washoe County. I decided to live in, in Nye County, so that's why I'm in Nevada. The, you probably also want to know, that, and I hope I'm not taking one of your questions, you probably want to know the reason I'm running. I didn't decide to run for U.S. Senate until the very last minute, uh, although we do our filing officially uh, next week. I file on Monday the 7th at 10.30 a.m. The, uh, the idea to get into the race and file with the FEC and start doing the, the reporting and, and gathering of funds and, and expenditures, I decided to do that after I saw the other three candidates that were running. There's nothing wrong with the other three candidates. They're just quite a bit younger than I am. I have a, a few more revolutions around the sun. And I can look at the audience here and the demographics and know who votes in our primary elections and Republican primaries tend to be the older voters. And I wanted to give an option for that to appeal to people that want a little bit more experience in Washington, D.C. than what we might potentially get. The other reason is that if we, if we miss this opportunity to put the right candidate through the primary, we will lose, potentially lose that, re that Republican seat to Catherine Cortez Masto. I feel that I have a very good chance at beating her in the election, in the general election, if I should be so fortunate to get there. So just based on age and experience. And then the other thing I want to mention is that I, I grew up at a time when uh, decorum and civility and politics in our homes and our churches and our business was a different place back in the days when I grew up as a kid. My father would have been 100 years old last October if he was still alive. So I feel that I'm a product of the greater generation. The fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. I, I, I got some of that information from my father and my mother that helps me live my life to get to where I am today. So I have a model for, of success and a little bit of experience to bring to the party. Um, would you share with us your military background? You were in the Army and the Air Force for 12 years? That's correct. So I started off in the Jimmy Carter administration, if you guys remember that far back, in the Army Reserves. I also registered to vote as a Republican. My father was an independent because he was a newspaper man, and he had to remain as an independent for that object objectivity. But my grandfather was a Republican and a good businessman. He owned a factory that made mattresses. And I always saw him carrying a wad of bills in his pocket all the time. I said, Republicans are rich. And I think the Republicans do have that entrepreneurial spirit and that capitalism about them, and it appealed to me. And I, I, I learned a lot from my grandfather and my father. And I wanted to be a Republican. So in the Jimmy Carter administration, while in the Army Reserves, I joined the Republican Party and voted for the first time for Ronald Reagan. I've been a 42-year lifelong Republican ever since. And I don't, I don't regret it one moment. I'm a conservative Republican. I do have some middle road tendencies. But, um, but that's because of the, of the, I've lived in a lot of places. I've seen a lot of things. The diversity of my military career taking me everywhere. So then I went to the active duty Air Force and I became an imagery interpreter, satellite reconnaissance work. I worked with the Air Force Electronic Warfare Center, which taught me a lot about national defense and the things that, that happened behind the scenes, things I can't tell you about. You know the story. Um, but I was also appointed as the Air Force liaison to the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. And that couldn't be more important than what we're facing today when we're talking about our work with our NATO nations, our foreign partners, and keeping America secure and helping the world stay safer. So the, everything that I learned while I was at the DIA applies today, even though it's dated material. I had top secret security clearances, and I had access to, to our goals and objectives as a nation and what we could do to keep our nation safe and our world safer. So that applies to what we're doing today with the, what you see going on overseas. So let me ask you about that. Um, you know, with what's happening, we're seeing it unfold on television, on social media. 
uh, with Ukraine, and what do you think about what's happening there and the United States' response to it? Well, I think that we missed an opportunity when President Biden took military options off the table several weeks ago before we got into the negotiations and the failed negotiations with, the United, with Russia. Um, I don't say military options in the fact that we necessarily need to have troops on the ground in Ukraine to protect uh, against the Russian invasion. However, taking it off the table does take it off the table, and therefore you are forced into a different posture if they don't think that you might use military force. So I would have rather seen us keep military force, at least in their minds, not necessarily boots on the, on the ground. But again, think back in the, in the times when we did put boots on the ground. I was in the first Gulf War, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and we put over 500,000 people on the ground in Saudi Arabia to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And if you think about the fact that America is a standard of the world, people look at America for guidance. They look at us for advice. They look for us to do the right thing. Americans always do the right thing, and that's what we're known for. And if it's unwarranted aggression against a, a, a country that's a sovereign nation that needs to keep its sovereignty, then the, America is the last line of defense when it comes to things like that. Now, I recognize Ukraine is not a NATO nation. I recognize there's corruption in Ukraine. There's corruption in Russia. There's corruption in the United States. And there's a lot going on with all of that. There's some things behind the scenes that even, that, well, but there's a lot of things that we don't understand about what's going on with corruption. And uh, you have to look, 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 look no further than the Biden administration to know what's happening with Ukraine and some of the mixed up uh, ramifications that all of that has caused us. So I think that our posture now working with the NATO nations and keeping them secure, that's the new last line that we have to hold. And it's going to be a tougher job for us. I think if we kept military options on the table, at least psychologically, they wouldn't have moved as aggressively as they'd done. And if we physically had boots on the ground, I truly believe there would not have been a shot fired or not a single drop of blood shed. Now we have civilians in Ukraine that are, that are wounded and shot. We have destruction beyond your imagination. We have Russian soldiers that are shot. They have brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, and children back at home, too. They're regular people. They're not the government of Russia. It's the government of Russia, and Putin in particular, that's the problem for this world. How do you think this is going to end? It's going to end badly. In what way? I think there'll be more destruction in Russia, or excuse me, Ukraine. I think that the Russians will end up succeeding. They have, the, they have the leverage on their side to succeed in Ukraine. We have to hope that we can stop it there so it doesn't go any further. We don't want Moldova or Romania or, or Poland to fall. Uh, we, have, we absolutely have to protect that. And the reason is, if we don't protect that, then China and all the other nations that are bent on the destruction of America will continue to pursue the destruction of America by doing their own agendas with Taiwan or what's North Korea want to do or what's Iran want to do with Israel. So we've almost missed the boat on correcting this and righting this ship. We have to make sure that the world knows that America stands with its allies and that we're strong. And that's the final line on that. Okay, so I, I, do, I do have one more question regarding this. And the reason I ask these questions is because if you plan to be a United States senator, then you will be involved in these kind of issues to the nth degree, more so than you were involved in any other part of your career. So even though the United States does not have boots on the ground, um, do you not believe that the United States is fully involved in what is occurring? Well, there, there is some involvement. There, we, we do have some, I would say, let's just say there's some blood on our hands by not predicting this sooner or reacting to it quicker. So I'm not going to say that the United States is, is innocent in any way on, on the things that are happening in Ukraine with Russia. We've, we've had the opportunity to do diplomacy before it happened. The problem is, is that Putin is not a person to be trusted. We can negotiate with him. And then it might go good for a couple of years, and then that negotiation gets forgotten. Look at what happened with Ukraine when they gave up all their nuclear weapons back in 1993. I would think it was 1,200 nuclear weapons that they had given up. And they thought that they were safe. They thought they were secure. They thought they would be able to continue their country. And look at where we're at today. So I think there's lots of fingers to point. I don't point everything at Russia. I don't point everything at Ukraine or the United States. I think there's a lot of blame to go around for everybody. And that's the unfortunate part of a war like this. We have to do a better job of predicting and using our intelligence to figure out what's going on. In the, and it, it's hard to figure out what's going on in the mind of a dictator and a ruthless thug and a murderer. So we have to be able to predict these things and react to them in a different way. 
Okay, but I do want to go back to my original point, which was, do you not believe that the United States, behind the scenes, is fully involved in what's happening with NATO and the opposition to what's happening in Ukraine from the Russians? Well, if I understand you correctly, you're asking if I believe that the United States is fully engaged with NATO to prevent? Yeah, d that, that we are not just sitting on the sidelines, oh, that we yes, are actively yeah. involved in doing our best to take care of Ukraine Absolutely. against the Russian Yeah, we effort. are providing aid, we're providing humanitarian aid, we are providing weapons and some defense items that, to Ukraine to help, them, to help them defend themselves. What we have to hope doesn't happen, and this is a complicated part, we send over a bunch of Stinger missiles, and if, you, if Russia is successful, then does that mean Russia has the Stinger missiles? That's a very complicated equation to come up with. But I do know that we're helping our NATO nations, we have those Article 5 treaties that are in place, and we have to, we have to uphold those. All right, so let's move on to uh, things closer to home. Um, as you mentioned, you had your choice of anywhere you wanted to live. You picked Knight County, which is a great place to live. Um, for all it represents um, now to leave and go to Washington, D.C., my first question, I guess, really is, why are you shooting for the top job? You could serve on a county commission. You could serve in the legislature. There are lots of opportunities, some that would allow you to remain, for the most part, in Nye County. Why choose the top job? Well, I, w I will still remain in Nye County, and I'll, I will do my job in Washington and come back to Nye County, not just to represent or, or be in, in Nye County, but to represent all Nevadans. Let me point out that I'll represent everybody in Nevada, and, and I'm not going to be your leader. Lead I will lead in Washington with the, my peers in Washington, D.C., to get things accomplished. And the whole idea is to get more done and, and create less problems. So do more than the problems you create, and, and I want to do that. But also to represent all Nevadans equally, whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, or nothing at all, uh, regardless of your differences, your religious differences, and, and all of the other things that make us different people, I want to represent everybody equally. But the, the reason to go to the top of the ticket to get to your original point was that I've reached a point in my life, in my stage, in my career, and all the things I've done during the military with the DIA, and what I've done, in, and we didn't even talk about what I'm doing medically, um, but uh, what, I've, what I've done in the medical career field as a, as a healthcare executive, I bring all of that to bear, that experience. So I've had a few more revolutions around the sun than a few folks, and I wanted to make sure that I brought that to the top of the ticket. It's a very important job. We have to make sure that we get reliable, honest, ethical people in Washington, D.C. to represent us. Okay, so all that being said, um, you know as well as I do, and as everybody else in this room knows, um, that raising money is a very important part of this. And you have Adam Laxalt, who is raising a ton of money. Uh, you have Captain Sam Brown, who has been raising over $2 million already, and certainly seems to be well on the way to getting a lot more. Um, are you going to be able to be competitive with those folks? Well, I, would, I don't plan on being competitive in the raising the money, and I didn't focus on it in the beginning. First of all, I'll mention that I've never run for politics before. I've never been a politician until now. I guess I'm counted as one now. And it might have been a little naive of me not to go out and raise money in the beginning, but I chose not to. I wanted to focus on policies and, and getting to know the people of Nevada better and, and doing it that way. I don't think that we necessarily need to vote for a person just because they've raised a lot of money. Now, granted, the, the more money you raise, the more media exposure you can get, and the, you can get out there and get people to know you. But money doesn't always solve the problem. So it certainly helps, and I just... Can you think of an example in the United States Senate race in the last couple of cycles where money has not been incredibly important? And I'm not saying whether that's a good or bad thing. I'm just saying that money is an incredibly important part of running for the United States Senate. Well, we still have an opportunity to raise money now. We still have 90 days left till the primary. It might be a little bit late. People's pockets might be a little empty from the prior giving. But I will say that I have not known of anybody running for the U.S. Senate that did it on a, on a nickel or a dime. They had to have significant funds. Uh, there are instances, and we've seen this recently, in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, somebody was a truck driver and they won the state Senate seat on $5,000 or some, some small amount like that. But it's a lot different when the United States Senate is 50-50 right. um, and every seat is important um, that there's going to be an incredible amount of money coming into the state. That's correct. And, and especially with the, the outside PAC money that comes in, um, there's going to be tremendous amounts of money flowing to both sides. And so if you're not you know, considered in that, that money reign, how do you convince those PACs 
to come in and support you because it's gonna be minimum $100 million spent in this state, which is insane, but $100 million with two major population centers um, over the next you know, eight months. Right, so getting through the primary obviously is the first objective. Once I get through the primary, then I'm sure the money will flow. If many of you don't know that PACs can't give to individual candidates like myself at this point, it has to be small dollar donations from individuals. If you owned a flower shop or a tire shop, you can't write a check to my campaign. It has to come from your name, Bob Smith's checking account. It can't come from corporations like it can for other state offices. So we're dealing with smaller amounts. And you're right, we've had candidates that have done very well with those small amount dollar donations nationwide. However, um, there are some issues in the way that it's raised and the, the things that were done to get there, and I don't want to get too, too vocal on that right now, but I don't agree with the way that that money was raised. Uh, do you want to give an example? Because you raised the issue. I think you should uh, explain what you're talking about. All right, well, I'm a, I, had my, my, I had my site up there early. I'm a straight shooter. That's my little logo and tagline, and I don't want to offend anybody here, but when you go out and, and tell a lie or exaggerate uh, you're, and, and you're, you're, you feel that you've been violated by the First Amendment, it doesn't, the First Amendment doesn't give you the right to lie or, or embellish the truth to get donations from individuals. And if you create fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the minds of everybody across the country, and you've got people in Missouri and Florida and Arkansas contributing $50, $60 to a campaign because they feel that the First Amendment rights are at stake over something that was, was contrived and planned for and ready for, I think that's fraud. Okay, and, so you're referring to Sam Brown when you bring that issue up. Yes. And, and you believe that whole issue was contrived? I was told it was contrived by one of his former campaign people that left the campaign. Okay. Well, I'll, but, I'll, but, leave, but, I'll leave it sit there because... But I'm not a reporter, so... There are obviously people that would disagree with you on that. Okay. But yep. let's move on. So on your website, um, you said, as your representative in the United States Senate, you'll bring real change through common sense legislation. Give us an example or two of common sense legislation. Yeah, so common sense legislation can revolve around things that I feel are most important to this country. So aside from having a strong military, we have to improve our economy. And I think that we can improve our economy by having a healthy relationship between industry and education. If you look at Nevada in particular, and there's a lot of states that fit this as well, they need a diversified uh, way of making money. It can't be all gaming and mining it has, and tourism. It has to be a diversified economy. So in order to get a diversified economy, I would propose legislation that involves both industry and education so that we provide the job force that's needed to attract industries to Nevada that are higher technology industries, things that are dealing with clean energy, biotech, things of that nature that we need um, to have a diversified economy in, in Nevada. So that's one piece of legislation that uh, I would think okay. about. Okay, do you not believe that that's already currently occurring? I mean, you look at northern Nevada, for example, I mean, we are so diversified that we bounce right back after the whole COVID situation. It was unbelievable how quickly uh, Northern Nevada bounced back. Southern Nevada is booming um, at this point. Um, I'm not sure we can take too much more in terms of diversification. We don't have the workforce here um, to be able to accommodate what we currently have. So, you know, how would you address that? And so, wouldn't that be better as a state issue rather than as a federal issue? Well, it can be a state issue, but it's also a federal issue because there's other states that need that type of legislation as well. So something that's done at the federal level that, that raises all states to the level that they need to be to have a diversified income. Just because we're somewhat successful in Nevada, and we're not totally successful in all of Nevada with that, but we have to be able to use that model so that every state can, why can't Idaho participate in this? Why can't Montana participate in this? So there's other things that need to be done across the country to make us stronger economically. Yeah, I, I would challenge your remark though. I think that it's very difficult to find places in Nevada, including Pahrump, where you come from, that aren't booming at this point in time. You look at the housing prices and it's right. just crazy. Um, all right, um, give us another example of legislation. Well, the other legislation would, again, going back to our strong military, you know, we need to do a better job of taking care of our veterans as an example. And the reason I mention that is that if you want a strong military, you have to make sure that you're encouraging people to come into the military that realize that there's a pathway for them once they leave. So let's say they've served 10 years or 20 years, whatever it might be. They need to be sure that the VA is taking care of them and that if they have a medical need or there's something else that we can do for them as they transition into civilian life, that they're supported. 
if a veteran feels that they're not being properly supported or might potentially not be pro properly supported once they leave, you might get less quality people to join the military. So I think that's another piece that, of legislation that we need to work on. Um, you know, you, you talk also on your website, uh, you say that Americans deserve more from elected officials, intelligent solutions instead of noise. Be specific. Well, we need to do a better job of making sure that we get honest and reputable people in Washington, D.C. that are actually, like I said earlier, able to actually get the job done and, and actually produce results for the American people. Americans deserve to get a return on their investment in their, all of their elected staff, whether it's a senator, a, a congressman, congresswoman, or any other local and state office. We need to do better. Americans deserve more. They deserve to be able to trust their government. And we need to make sure that our elected officials are upholding the standards that we expect them to. You know, the average American is very hardworking, honest, and all of those things, those attributes that are good American values, not Republican values or Democrat values, American values. And we all know what those are. Honesty, integrity, you know, uh, be a good neighbor, all of those things that make us good people are the things that we want to see in our elected officials. We don't want to see um, extremism, you know, pandering for extremism and, and getting attention from the media or whatever it is they're trying to do. You know, this, this left and right, far left and far right stuff and the way the media handles everything is out of control. Okay, so one of the, and you, you come to the other point I wanted to make. Um, uh, in that same sentence you were talking uh, on your website about, um, you talk about coalition building among both parties. So what areas do you think there is common ground between Republicans and Democrats that you would be in favor of furthering if you were sent to Washington, D.C.? Sure. So I think all Americans, all Americans actually understand that we deserve, and I mentioned this earlier, that we all deserve more out of our elected officials. So in doing so, if everybody was to participate in our government, vote, and vote your conscience, not necessarily vote what you, it seems to be popular at the moment when you're at a rally or you're, you know, you're, you're pumped up and things like that. You've got you to gotta remember, when you sit down at the voting booth or you're at your table when the, your paper ballot comes out, whichever way you decide you want to vote, you have to make sure that we're putting the person in office that has honesty and integrity behind the, everything that they do, what they've done in life, what they've done on the campaign especially. We look at candidate integrity. We look at, we look at voter integrity and making sure that as a participant in this entire process this, that we call America, that we make sure that we put the elected officials in place that, that will get the job done. Okay, so, and that includes Democrats then? As far as? As in the inclusion in that list, if they, they hit all those qualifications, but they happen to be Democrats, because you're saying that you, you, know, you want to see coalition building among both parties. We're a two-party system, and there are Democrats and there are independents that have great ideas, so. I'm not an anti-Democrat, I'm not anti-independent, I'm not anti-Republican. I'm saying that we're Americans and we have to figure out a way to cooperate with each other to get more done. There are too many times when we're, this whole country split. The whole country split and even our own Republican Party split. You know, we have people calling people rhinos, we have people pointing fingers, calling names. We have too much of that going on. Let's come together as America. Let's quit, let's quit the inner, inner, inner fighting that we have going on with our own party so our party can succeed. How long has it been since Nevada has had a successful run in, in the Republican Party? Look at what's been going on for the last 10 years. Yeah, I know we had the, the wave in 2014. We have a wave now, but we have to protect that. We have to make sure that we take advantage of that, but we have to do it ethically. And that's where we have to leave it. Bill Hochstedler. We'll see you on the campaign trail. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Hochstedler, and my website, just so I can plug that real quick, my website does not have my name on it like other candidates in all the other races. My website is victory2022.org. I do that because we're achieving a victory2022.org. This campaign is about all of us. It's not about me. I didn't put Bill Hochstedler for Senate on my website. It's victory2022.org. Please check it out. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Bill.